So I'm so pleased to be able to engage in a conversation with Dr. Michael Wagner uh, about the new project that we've worked on together over the past year, and that is the reissuing the second edition of a Christian Citizenship Guide. It's uh, ARPA's latest publication, a 256-page book on, on Christian citizenship specifically for Canada. So, uh, so glad that we can chat about it together. Thanks so much for coming into Ottawa in order to have that conversation. Maybe let's start with, well, why a Christian citizenship guide? Well, I think that Christians need to understand the political system from a specifically Christian perspective. I mean, there's lots of books out there about um, Canadian politics and how to participate in it, but Christianity has its own worldview, and so it has its own way of viewing government and politics and how to engage in politics and government. So we wanted a book that would instruct Christians about how to look at Christ how to look at politics from a Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. The first edition had four chapters. We covered can Canadian history. We co covered the Charter of Rights. Um, we covered uh, human rights, yeah. uh, particularly human rights commissions and human rights tribunals, which is a really big issue in 2008 to 2010. Yeah. Um, and then we also covered uh, the final chapter being how do you get involved as a Christian in yeah. politics. So we've built on that, we've expanded on that, and we've added uh, a, a longer history chapter uh, to understand how did we get the government we've got and mm -hmm. we actually go mm -hmm. back 800 years mm -hmm. and and we look at the Magna Carta at the time of Robin Hood uh, and and we work it all the way up to, to to today how do we get the government that we have and when we understand that history I'm I hoping mm -hmm. that those who read this book understand why it's so important not to uh, repeat the mistakes of the past mm -hmm. and to also value the institutions that we have in place and the roles that they play in government as checks and balances on on tyranny on on certain players or certain institutions um, taking over the role of other institutions I mean it also shows the importance of Christianity in the development of, mm -hmm. of individual rights and human rights as we know them today because mm -hmm. that's kind of what that history is as the um, as the people struggle against absolute tyranny and then the need to reduce the power and scope of government mm -hmm. that's all about you know giving people more liberties, more freedoms in their own lives to live mm -hmm. where they're not under subjection to a particular government. And that was, in many respects, many of the historical instances, it's motivated specifically by Christianity mm -hmm. as driving people to be involved. Another thing we expanded was that we took took the original chapter that was on, on the Charter and on human rights and we split it into two. So we did a whole chapter on the Charter, uh, we did another chapter on human rights. The, the chapter on the Charter, we looked at the good and the bad, like there's some bad that came with the Charter in 1982. Uh, but the charters didn't come out of nothing. It didn't mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. appear out of the mind of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually borrowing from uh, some of his ideas. Anyway, are borrowed from uh, from Christianity, from mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. ideas that have come out of Scripture. Yeah. So even things like um, equality before the law, uh, equality under the law, you can see scriptural um, um, uh, precedents. Yeah, thank you, precedents mm -hmm. for that. Um, or, or even like a lot of the legal rights about due mm -hmm. process and uh, careful examination of witnesses and so on. That's, that's embedded in scripture. People mm -hmm. pick up the book of Deuteronomy, they'll see it there mm -hmm. if they have eyes to see. The idea that Pierre Trudeau had about having a charter of rights, that certainly is in continuity with the Western tradition that comes out of Christian ideas of having a constitutional mm -hmm. limitation on government. So in that sense, Trudeau was working within a kind of a Christian general framework of developing constitutionalism by having a document that would limit rights and freedoms, mm -hmm. but he was doing it, he was already in the stages of uh, like having a different worldview than mm -hmm. Christianity, so although he was starting with that kind of basic Christian idea, that's where he came, it started from, he kind of started to take it in a different yeah. direction, and so, right. so the Charter doesn't um, continue the Christian tradition in the way that it should have, it right. starts to introduce new basic worldview ideas mm -hmm. different from Christianity, using a Christian idea and taking it in a different direction, which is why in many instances the Charter of Rights has led to um, you know, outcomes that Christians cannot support or be favorable right. about. Yeah, take take um, abortion, although abortion was first legalized by Prime Minister uh, Pierre Trudeau, but greatly expanded by the Supreme Court. Euthanasia was legalized by the Supreme Court. Prostitution was nearly legalized by the Supreme Court. Safe injection sites were legalized by the Supreme Court. Um, a lot, a lot of policy work has been mm -hmm. done by the Supreme Court of Canada uh, under the Charter. And actually, one of the biggest, biggest cases we talk about it in the book uh, is the Big M Drug Mart case, the first religious freedom case done mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1985. And what they did there is that they said, well, freedom of religion includes freedom from religion, and and therefore struck down the idea that any any law could ever be passed that has any sort of Christian explicit or overt overt uh, Christian um, 
a basis for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I think they bought the idea that that somehow uh, secularism or a secular humanism is, is somehow more neutral. But, mm -hmm. but of course, secular humanists are just as religious as Christians are. And, and of course, when we look at Canada's history, uh, we don't uh, glorify the past in the mm -hmm. sense as, as if mm -hmm. we say, you know, if only we were exactly like we yeah, were in yeah. 1867, yeah. then all would be well, because we, we do point out some of the flaws back then as well. And we, we talk about, uh, for example, the residential schools is right. one of the case studies that we work through in the sixth chapter, where we, we show how the government had, uh, even if there were professing Christians within the government, uh, too many of them had a flawed view of the role of the state versus yeah. the role of the family yeah. and and the, the the place that the church played in in that particular episode of, of our history and so we talk through that I think in a nuanced way a lot of the nuance that we talk about is missed in the mainstream narrative about mm -hmm. residential schools but I think uh, our readers if they if they pick up the book and they give it a read they might find that section actually quite interesting so yeah, I think that's really important, though, that we're not glorifying Canada's Christian mm -hmm. past. Like, I, I like to talk about Canada's Christian past and how mm -hmm. important it is, mm -hmm. and it's there, and people should need to understand it, but, but I'm not saying that that was a better time. We're not right. saying that there was a golden age of Canadian right. history that we wanted to return to, mm -hmm. but we can see what was there, and we can actually learn from history. Yes. We can see what they did wrong, like with, with the residential schools, and we can do better in the future, mm -hmm. starting with the same Christian worldview, yeah. seeing the view, the mistakes that were made by the Christians in the past, making sure we don't repeat those mistakes so the future can actually be better than the past. Mm -hmm. I think another uh, really interesting theme that struck me as the book was being developed in this second stage or in the second edition uh, was the the idea of the Imago Dei and how often mm. that came up. Like it, it was it came up in um, in the human rights chapter, which is chapter five, um, where we talk about a foundation or maybe even the foundation of human rights from a Christian or a biblical perspective is this idea of Imago Dei that you and me and, and every human being is made in the image of God, right? We get that straight out of Genesis 1 and 2. Um, and that by that very fact, because every human being, Christian or not, is made in the image of God, uh, that they are therefore deserving of uh, respect, of, of uh, they have inherent dignity, and, uh, and that law must protect them in, in their life, in their liberty, in their property. And um, so that concept of Imago Dei makes sense right there mm -hmm. in the human rights chapter, but then it appears again in chapter six when we talk about not just sphere sovereignty, but we also talk about the idea of office. And then it, it reappears again, the concept of Imago Dei reappears again in the final, the seventh chapter about being engaged in politics as, as Christian citizens. Everybody is born into a family mm -hmm. and, a, and as a result of their position, the family has certain duties and responsibilities. Yeah. Everybody's also born into a political society right. and as a result of their birth into that political society, they have certain duties and responsibilities there. So uh, what would distinguish Christians as citizens from other citizens? Is is there something that's unique about Christian engagement in politics? And I think when I think about that, I think there's there's probably a lot of Christians who think, well, the the realm of, of citizenship, the realm of politics, it's it's a neutral realm. It's a it's a part of the secular realm. So really you know, Christians should be engaging just like any other Canadian. Um, in fact, if we're sticking out too much, then, then maybe we're doing a disservice to Christianity. Politics and government is about making laws, and laws always say something is right and something is wrong. Right. So there is an ethical basis to every single law, every single policy that's ever done, mm -hmm. and that ethical basis cannot be neutral. There's no such thing as an, a neutral ethical basis. It's either from one perspective or another. So if a law is not based on a Christian worldview, it's based on a non-Christian worldview. So every Every kind of, anything that happens in law and politics is based on a particular worldview. There is no neutrality. I mean, just ask yourself, what is the neutral position on abortion? Right. Is the neutral position to allow the babies to be killed? Or is the neutral position to prevent the babies from being killed? Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that our minds and our thoughts line up with God's thoughts on particular issues. Mm -hmm. So we need to participate as Christians and not as some kind of a neutral citizen because that is absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. The thing that Christians are engage, uh, are striving for in political engagement is not self-interest, but what is good for the public good, what is good for, for everyone in society. Um, and so does that come out of our own uh, Christian worldview? Yes, but that's because we have access to the truth with big capital T. Um, and we know uh, that, that the, Christian, the Christian perspective, the biblical perspective will be for the public good when it comes to, to the big questions of politics. Our approach is also seeing an elected representative as being an office bearer mm -hmm. under God with responsibility to God for their office, whether they recognize it or not, but then being there to assist them, say, I, I know a better way, not because I'm so smart, but because I have access to the truth. 
And would you consider, please, supporting this better way on, on an issue like abortion or euthanasia? Um, I think the how is different as well, that we not uh, result to, uh, or sorry, resort to um, uh, you know, fear mongering or, or that sort of thing, but we engage uh, confident in who our Lord is, who the King is, mm -hmm. and then um, out of that confidence, uh, yeah, try to engage our, our civic leaders and, and the rest of society um, to, to see the truth and to see the goodness and beauty of, of, of the Christian way of doing politics. There's no reason for us to be angry at our politicians. Like, even though they're doing bad things and we don't like what they're doing, mm -hmm. I mean, objectively, some of the things they're doing are evil. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't do any good to call them names, to yell at them, right. you know, and to participate in that kind of way. As mm -hmm. it, we still need to approach them meekly and humbly mm -hmm. and, you know, tell them the truth. Uh, you know, my hope uh, is that many, many Christians pick up this book, right? That you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, this is a unique book. There's nothing like it in Canada. It's right. unique to Canadians who yeah. are Christians. And it's unique about uh, civic engagement, about political action and, and, and engagement. So, so any Christian who picks up this book should be able to not only read a little bit of history, read a bit, read a little bit and learn a little bit about um, how Canada's governments work, but then what their role is in, in all of that, uh, all of course from a Christian lens. So my hope anyway is that many, many Christians from across this country, from across denominations, federations, traditions, would, would pick up this book, give it a read and be inspired by the words in there to 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 get to get involved. Yeah.